Severo, an interviewer for the Oral History Project of the Berkeley Historical Society. Today, March 17, 2022, I am with Susan Cohen in Berkeley. Good afternoon, Susan. Hi, Michael. Will you tell us about your childhood, where you were born, when you were born, and about your family? Well, first of all, thank you and the Historical Society for your interest. I was born in Mount Vernon, New York, which is a suburb of New York City. And my family, my, my parents uh, were both born in the Boston area and uh, grew, grew up there. My mother went to girls Latin school. My father went to boys Latin school, which these were academic high schools you got into by diplomas and they fed into Harvard University and Radcliffe, which was the women's college of Harvard. And uh, my father got a PhD also at Harvard in um, psychology. And at the end of his uh, studies there, instead of offering him a job, a teaching job, because he was Jewish and they didn't really hire, believe it or not, <laughs> Jews as professors, in those days, um, they gave him a, a traveling fellowship to spend the year in Europe. And um, at which point he proposed to my mother and uh, they went off and spent their first year in, mostly in Rome. And uh, while in Rome, they watched Mussolini's black shirts marching about. And uh, my father decided he didn't know, he no longer wanted to be a professor. He, he wanted to do something more meaningful in terms of, of human beings and working on uh, helping the world. And, and so when they came back, um, he became a social worker. And my mother also uh, uh, got a master, my mother got a master's in social work and also became a social worker. And later he did in fact become a professor and he uh, was an associate dean of social work at Columbia University, which is the position he held when I was born. And because of that, because he was an academic, we moved around a lot. So although I was born in New York, we then moved to a suburb of Cleveland and then we moved to Los Angeles and I actually graduated high school uh, by correspondence course from Hong Kong uh, where he was spending a, a semester and we were with him. And then I, I spent a year at UC Santa Cruz and then after that transferred to Berkeley, where, um, which I loved Berkeley in its heyday and it was a very exciting place to be. And, uh, and then I went to uh, uh, journalism school and, and got a master's in journalism at Berkeley. Um. How would you describe your family's relationship to Judaism? Were they affiliated? Uh, would, yeah. Not really. I would, I would say proudly Jewish, but mostly secular. My yeah. father used to call himself a gastronomic Jew. Um, my, my mother uh, was a little more insistent that we learn something about it. She was they were primarily Jewish because they grew up in large Jewish, extended Jewish families in Jewish neighborhoods. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, my mother took a class in Judaism when she was in college. She didn't really know that much about it, but she wanted us to have a little Jewish education. We always celebrated um, Passover, um, Hanukkah, you know, a few other things. And I had a few years of uh, Jewish, education, but I would say it was, wasn't the religion that was important so much as the, as the family link and the history and the ethnic identi identification. Well, were they uh, affiliated with any synagogues? Uh, like, well, we, I, I'm thinking, like in Los Angeles, I, uh, 
Oh yeah, we, no. We we when we were in Cleveland, uh, they were uh, a, a Fairmont Temple, I think it was called. Um, had a very famous rabbi who went down to Selma and got beaten up. Arthur Lillyveld. Um, my father yeah. also went down to Selma, but uh, he didn't get beaten up, luckily. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, that was the only period. Um, mm. Yeah, my, my oldest brother um, uh, came home one day, this is the family story, and said he'd been going to uh, lessons with a, a close friend of his and he wanted to be bar mitzvahed and that came as a great shock to, to my parents. So he was in fact bar mitzvahed. Um, and I was, my other brother and I were something that was called confirmed, which was like a, a Sunday school graduation. Yeah. yeah. So, but to be confirmed, you would have had to be affiliated, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's when we belonged to family. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take a look at... Um, some photographs you showed us um, or sent us three photographs. Uh, this, I believe, is the oldest one. Uh, can you identify the people in the photographs? You know, the only people I can identify are the, the very um, sporty looking couple in the back. Please, please. Uh, uh, yes, I believe that that I know the photograph is from my father's side of the family and that that's his mother, uh, Ada, and his father, David. And I believe one of the children is and, uh, and those would have been Ada's parents seated mm -hmm. and amongst the children uh, sitting in front. One of them, I think, was my father's sister, Esther, my aunt Esther who was um, the only one of my uh, father's siblings who was born in Russia. And I think the couples, one of those seated couples, maybe the man with his arms crossed very uh, aggressively on the left there, uh, that may have been my grandmother's brother. I know her brother came over uh, with his family as well. And um, I don't know what year this would have been, but it would, would have been taken somewhere near Kiev in the Ukraine. And I assume it was one of those pictures families took when some part of them were, were, were emigrating to America. Mm. Mm. Uh, do you have any idea who this couple is? No, um, no. Yeah. My, my father had a, a memory a stark memory from when he was maybe nine or 10 years old in Boston uh, of his mother receiving a telegram telling her that her whole family uh, there, everybody who stayed behind had been killed in a pogrom mm -hmm. in a single night, uh, chased into a cemetery and slaughtered. So, mm -hmm. um, and I, I never heard much about my grandfather's family, uh, that grandfather at all. He, he, uh, he died mm -hmm. in the 1920s when my father was 17. And um, mm -hmm. um, I know he started a, a sausage business over here that did very, very well for a while and then not so well. And, and then he died. And um, I really, mm -hmm. I assume he came from the same general area. You know, these uh, clothes of uh, the elderly couple, I mean, do they tell anything uh, about? Well, they look uh, obviously religious, uh, 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 but uh, while, the, while the younger generation look like they're kind of ready to take on the world, they're dressed in very modern looking stylish clothes. Yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, I don't know whether they were, I've never heard that anybody in the family was Hasidic, although that certainly was a part of the world with, where Hasidism uh, uh, came from, uh, but clearly they were religious. And I, I think the only, the other thing that's interesting about that family is that my 
grandmother, Ada, who's the one grandparent I sort of knew because she lived till I was 18. And I say, I say sort of knew because we never lived near her. Um, and her English was very poor. And the reason for that was that before she left the Ukraine, she promised her parents she would raise her children Jewish and she would teach them Yiddish. So she mm -hmm. spoke Yiddish to them and they spoke English to her. And they never mm -hmm. really learned Yiddish, although I'm sure my father understood it. Um, and she never really learned English. Hmm. Did you ever um, talk to your, to Ada uh, about the old country? Did you, or did you ever talk to your parents about stories they may have told you about? My mother was much more forthcoming about her family. Um, hmm. uh, uh, she was very proud of her family. Uh, I think uh, Ada and, and, and David were in business. And um, my mother's family, I think, was, was much more educated. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, uh, and, and my mother's family came from Lithuania rather than the Ukraine. So uh, mm -hmm. I heard a fair amount about my mother's family. Uh, as I say, Ada was very difficult to communicate with, I, I, I think I found her uh, a little off-putting. She was, she was very foreign, literally, to me, and a little bit stern, and she didn't speak much English. Uh, mostly what I remember is uh, if she came to visit us, which she did occasionally, my mother would drive all over town finding kosher meat and a copy of the Yiddish forwards. <laughs> Uh, how about your dad? Did he ever talk about um, his parents? Well, these are his parents. Yeah. Uh, no, not really. Uh, well, he, he said his father had a great sense of humor. And, um, and he remembered that, um, so when his father had the sausage factory, it was, uh, I think it was during Prohibition, and there was a, a an illegal still uh, or, or a brewery across the street. And the Boston police uh, used to come and get their free beer, illicit beer. And then they'd come to my dad's father's place across the street and get basically hot dogs, Frankfurters, he called them, uh, to go with the beer. <laughs> so, um, oh, there is what, my father was born actually in, um, in Derry, New Hampshire. Uh, and I don't know what what his parents, uh, Ada and David, what drew them to Derry, New Hampshire. There certainly weren't weren't very many Jewish people there at the time, and um, they did pretty well, I guess, because his father uh, came home one day and told his mother that um, he'd bought a farm, and he he'd shaken hands with the farmer on the deal, and he took her to see the property and they got lost and she was terrified and I made him um, go tell the farmer he wasn't buying it after all. <laughs> and the other story from, from New Hampshire was that when she gave birth there to my father in 1909, the, um, the, the staff in the hospital and the nurses were all French Canadian. And, and so they didn't necessarily speak much English and, she certainly didn't speak much English. And they wanted my father's name for the birth certificate. And my grandmother tried to, to tell them that um, they were going to wait until the bris, the circumcision. And uh, so she kept saying something that, that basically was later. And um, years later, after my father and mother married and they were gonna to go to Europe, my father had to apply for a passport and, and find his birth certificate. And he discovered that his name legally was Later Cohen. Mm. <laughs> Did, um, but the, uh, Nathan uh, didn't tell, your, your father didn't uh, tell you stories that uh, about his parents 
uh, uh, life in Ukraine. I mean, uh, I don't think it was something they particularly wanted to talk about. I mean, he yeah. heard that her family had been wiped out in the pogrom. He, I yeah. don't know how much he knew about his father's yeah. family. Yeah. Um, I think her brother, who was in that picture, they went on um, in business, and and my father, uh, of course, took a different. My father and his brother. Uh, my uncle Phil both got PhDs and became professors. So I think that there was a sort of sense that they, <laughs> that they, you know, that was the business side of the family, but you know, they were the academic side of the family. So, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know where anybody lived. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I didn't grow up in Boston. I, I, I have a feeling most, whatever family was left on that side was probably in Boston. Jewish lore of there is, you know, Jews went through uh, Ellis Island or, uh, you know, were in the Lower East Side and came out of New York. How did they end up in Boston? Uh, there's a large Jewish community in Boston. Uh, I, I don't know. Oh. Um, the, the, uh, I know a little bit more about my, my mother's mother uh, and her passage over. I, I really mm. don't. Um, I learned a few years ago from from a cousin that that this grandmother Ada had actually gone back at one very early on. She didn't like America because there weren't enough Jews. Maybe that's when maybe that's when she was in New Hampshire and then come back. So yeah. uh, she couldn't have stayed over there very long because my father was is not that much. Um, younger than than the sister who was born there and he and, mm -hmm. and, and his older brother were born here mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us uh who is in this picture yes yeah, so that's um my father's family that's ada and david again on the on the left and my and david is holding my father i don't know how old would you say he is there maybe two <laughs> so that's mm -hmm. my father nathan uh and his brother phil to the left uh uh the far left of the picture who was one year older and who became a, a professor of biochemistry at the university of wisconsin and then his sister nettie uh and his standing up with her hand on her father's shoulder would have been esther and then the other family i'm not positive about but it might have been david's brother but um i as i say i i wasn't raised knowing anything about that family so mm -hmm. so let's see let me so this is um david's I'm, brother yeah i'm not sure but i'm oh oh okay and that is you, no. you his wife i assume and children and uh and they and, would name cohen but i i don't know more than yeah. that and and this uh, that's Esther, my aunt it, Esther. Oh, okay. And and this is Nathan and others. <laughs> <laughs> my uncle Phil, my aunt yeah. Uh, Nettie. Yeah. And and, it, and this was taken in the United States, obviously. Yes, and, this would have been in the Boston area. I think they lived in various. Places I think I heard Matap Matapa. I don't know Boston, but Roxbury yeah. maybe. Um, I think they made the typical uh, immigrant uh, <laughs> journey from from suburb to slightly better suburb to slightly better suburb. Mm. Okay. And then when they went to college, both my parents lived at home, and um, it was a period when uh, Harvard and Radcliffe were. Um, accepting a lot of Jewish students out of, who came out of these Latin high schools because uh, they didn't, they lived at home and they didn't have to provide dorm space for them. Mm -hmm. So uh, my mother used to talk about taking the trolley with the richer kids from, from Brookline, but they, <laughs> they weren't smart enough necessarily to go to Radcliffe. They only went to Smith, or I don't know. I don't know the story, but. <laughs> I probably just alienated a lot of Smithies here. <laughs> okay. 
Yes, so this is a picture that I actually only obtained because you asked me for photographs and I, and I emailed various cousins. And um, as I mentioned to you, my parents' house burned down in the Oakland Hills fire and they lost all their photographs. Um, but I don't know that they ever had this. This is my mother's grandmother, Nahama, uh, or Anna in this country. In the, in, in, she came from Kovna or Konas. Kovna is the Yiddish name for it, mm -hmm. Lithuania. And um, so the story of this family is that uh, the father, uh, Avram, Abraham, Abel, I've heard various names, Vygotsky, was an engineer um, and uh, he may have even trained in Germany, that's one version I've heard, and he was a city engineer and probably for Conus or maybe for Vilna, and he was sent over by the government to the United States um, um, to study the levees in New Orleans. And while here, his, his wife uh, died, uh, leaving him with two children. And he went back to Lithuania and he married this woman, Nahama, who was about 20 years younger than he was. And they proceeded to have, um, oh, maybe five children together. And the two oldest boys the, the, who from the first wife, as soon as they were old enough, they left and went to South Africa. Um, and then my grandmother was the eldest of the children born to Nahama. And she was, and in Lithuania, she was attending a gymnasium, which is a secular high school, very unusual for Jewish girls. And she was studying French and, um, and um, uh, uh, so clearly this was an educated middle-class family. And, um, but uh, she was sent on her own, maybe this was after the father died, could have been. She was sent on her own when she was 14 or 15 to cross the Atlantic and meet relatives she had never met in Boston. And when she and when and they met her at the uh, at the boat, and she fully expected to continue her education here. And they informed her they'd found her a job, sewing. Probably she was a fantastic seamstress, and um, it was a huge disappointment in her life. And uh, gradually, all the other children came over and Nahama. And my mother's memory of her growing up was that she moved in, Nahama moved in with them. She, she and my mother shared a bedroom, maybe even a bed uh, when my mother was a teenager. And Nahama of course spoke Yiddish. And my mother's family, my mother's father was 300% American. Uh, and it was an English speaking family. My mother said her mother spoke excellent English. Um, I only knew that grandmother uh, after she had several strokes. So, and she mm -hmm. only, and she died when I was about eight. So, but um, but um, Nahama moved in to the with them, and because uh, my mother wanted to be able to talk to her, my mother learned Yiddish, but her brothers never did. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and both families basically lost the language. Um, but but my my mother uh, learned enough to, to take her grandmother for walks and to walk around with her and to converse a little bit with her. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when I was growing up, uh, uh, I always wrote. And one of the first types of writing I did was, I, I think I wrote my first poem when I was five or six. And my mother told me that, you know, your great grandmother, Nahama, and I have her name as my middle name, Susan Ann Shoshana Nechama in Hebrew, uh, wrote poetry. She wrote poetry in Yiddish and she even had it published once in the, in the Jewish newspaper, the Jewish Daily Forward. And um, so that's what I know about my great-grandmother Nechama. Of course, she died be before I was born.
you seem much more comfortable talking about your uh, mother's family and your well, like like most like most families the mothers share more about their families than the fathers i think that's yeah. that's a generalization but i think uh uh yeah so my mother talked a lot more about her family yeah yeah but, um, when, but when we visited boston which we did a, a little bit when we were living in new york we moved from new york when i was nine but up to then we'd visit boston and we had to very, um, it had to be very equitable. A certain number of nights staying with my father's side of the family, a certain so number of nights staying with my mother's side of the family. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, did your, um, uh, your, your knowledge about the uh, families, I mean, did you, um, uh, learn about the family mainly through your mother? Did you talk to your grandmother, uh, was Celia? No, as I say, Celia died when I was about eight. We didn't, oh. we didn't live near her and, she'd, and she, her, her speech, my mother said she spoke excellent English, but her speech was very slurry by then because, because she was, um, had had strokes. Mm. But, I do remember once she visited us and uh, I had a best friend. I must've been in kindergarten, maybe first grade. And we were the two best readers in the class. And I came home and I bragged to her that we were the two best readers in the class. And my friend Johnny was standing right next to me. And she said, and she said who's the best? And I said, because I kind of already knew that girls weren't supposed to brag about being better than boys, I said, Johnny is. And she turned to me and she said, why not you? And that just stuck with me. And the other thing I remember um, was that she, um, I asked her once about this language. My mother always, were, she never referred to it as Yiddish. She called it Jewish. And it wasn't until I started to learn Yiddish that I understood that Yiddish means Jewish. <laughs> and, um, uh, but she'd say, your grandmothers spoke Jewish. So I asked my grandmother, Celia, Nana, I called her, um, to say something in Yiddish. And she would seem very reluctant. And then she said, um, she told me a sentence, which was, as is a Zay cult, which means, it's, it's very cold. And when I started learning Yiddish, I realized, I thought I'd remembered it wrong because I was taught that the word is a zoi, not a ze. And I thought, oh, well, I was five or six. But it turns out that's how they pronounce it in, Lithua in the Lithuanian dialect. Move on now to some um, uh, personal things with you. Uh, can you talk, tell us about your schooling? Yeah, so I, I started at, um, as I said, I graduated by correspondence course, uh, 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 but I, I went to, I started high school in, in Shaker Heights outside of Cleveland. I finished it at, at uh, in, at, uh, Pally High, Palisades High, and um, and uh, and I spent a year at UC Santa Cruz. And while I was there, I I had to take a language for the language requirement, and I took Russian. And it fits in with what we've been talking about because in one of my last conversations with my father's mother, my grandmother Ada, I told her very excitedly, uh, "I'm learning Russian, so now we can talk." And there was this awkward pause at the other end of the line, and she got, and she said, uh, "I don't remember." And and then it struck me she may never have spoken Russian or Ukrainian. She may only have spoken Yiddish. But of course, mm -hmm. in those days, they didn't teach Yiddish in the university, and um, and now of course they do. But. Um, uh, but it was a disappointment to me. 
<laughs> anyway, I transferred from UC Santa Cruz to UC Berkeley. Um, I spent a year at uh, uh, University of Sussex in Brighton, England. I uh, came back to UC Berkeley and I, uh, I went to graduate uh, school there. I got it in journalism. Um, what is that correspondence school? <laughs> I don't know that it still exists. If it does, it's on Zoom. But uh, it used to be for people who I, I couldn't go to finish high school in Hong Kong because we were only there for six or seven months and it was on the mm -hmm. British school system where the senior year, you're just studying for their crazy exam system. Mm -hmm. So um, I only had two or three classes left. So you would I would write <laughs> my essays and my homework. I'd, I'd put it, on, I'd, I'd write it on this uh, air mail paper, very thin paper, send it to, to some teacher somewhere. He would comment and send it back. And um, that's how it worked. <laughs> <laughs> I took driver's education that way. Um, tell us about your employment. So after I finished journalism school, uh, where I had a great time, uh, uh, and and that's where I met my uh, husband. He he uh, uh, had started a master's program in um, in uh, engineering, earthquake engineering, soils engineering, and uh, and uh, I I was sharing a house. Uh, one of the girls I was, young women I was sharing a house with, with, had been best friends in high school with his sister. So he came up to Berkeley looking for housing and camped out on our living room floor for a few weeks. And that's, that's how we met. And um, uh, when I finished journalism school, uh, it was very hard to find a job because uh, local newspapers were not hiring women, except for what was then called the women's section, women's pages. Um, um, and um, I worked first for the uh, Oakland Board of Education briefly until a job opened up at a group of community newspapers, weeklies in Santa Clara County. Mm -hmm. So I did that for uh, a few years, and and then uh, the San Jose Mercury News got a new editor, and uh, I got hired there. A bunch of us did. A bunch of us women got hired there, and I got hired as a summer replacement night police reporter in the North County Bureau. <laughs> but I um, I. Uh, worked at the Mercury News for 11 or 12 years and uh, I was a science writer. I opened a San Francisco bureau for them. I wrote for their magazine um, and, uh, and we bought a house in Menlo Park where my daughter was born. And a couple of, and my husband was working in Oakland. Uh, we, we lived various places around the Bay, Fremont, San Francisco and um, and uh, we both loved Berkeley. So uh, our second house uh, uh, we bought in Berkeley. My daughter was about two. And, uh, oh. and a few years after that, my, uh, my parents moved up to be closer. When you were at Berkeley, you see, did you uh, work on the Daily Californian? No, I didn't know I wanted to be a journalist at that point. I actually, you know, I, I, I grew up writing poetry. And when I came to UC Berkeley, I applied to get into a poetry workshop. And, um, and I wasn't accepted. It was a you know, tiny workshop with a lot of applicants. And I was crushed. I was 17, maybe 18. And um, I thought it meant I had no talent. And I didn't write another poem for almost 30 years. Uh, but um, but I, I, I wrote, I wrote a lot of papers, of course, and um, my senior year, I was a political science major, a major I chose because I was interested in current events, but also because it had the fewest requirements so I could take whatever I wanted. And I took, you know, a whole class in Dostoevsky and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, 
I, I just took whatever I wanted, basically. Uh, and and when I um, and I took one journalism class. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was about to graduate, the professor who was the uh, led the uh, honors political science seminar I was in, uh, I ran into him on campus. And as we were walking, he asked me what I was going to do next. And I said, I don't know. I was thinking of law school, and he said, "Oh, don't do that. The, there's everybody's going to be a lawyer." And I said, "Well, I was thinking maybe public administration." He said, "I don't know. I think you'd be bored studying that." He said, "If I could write like you do, I'd be a journalist." And it was like, <laughs> so, um, mm -hmm. so I applied to journalism school. I really hadn't done anything except write a few assignments for the one undergraduate class I'd taken, and luckily I got in. <laughs> yeah. So you said that uh, you didn't write another poem for 30 years. What got you back into writing poetry? As my kids started to grow up, I just found myself writing an occasional poem. And, and, and then I started reading more poetry, which I hadn't done for a long time. And, um, and, uh, and I got interested in it, and there was a, a publication, it's now all online, but it used to be a broadsheet print publication that was free in the bookstores in Berkeley called Poetry Flash. Uh, Richard Silberg and, and Joyce Jenkins were really the, the main, the backbone of the Berkeley and Bay Area poetry scene. And I, um, I enlisted all the readings, and it had ads, it had an ad, put in by a poet named Kim Adonisio, quite well known, and uh, she was offering workshops. And um, out of her home, she wasn't affiliated with the university, you didn't have to apply to anything. And I started doing that and I just, um, then when I, uh, uh, so after my son was born in 1985, I didn't want to keep driving down to, to the San Jose Mercury. And so um, I uh, got a job. Uh, there was an opening, a, a faculty, uh, a full-time tenure track position at, at the journalism school. And they hired me and I was teaching. And, um, but, you know, it was, a, and I did that for five or six years, but it was a, I had two young kids, elderly parents, and a few months after I started the job, I herniated two discs in my back, and it was all kind of overwhelming. And um, as my back started to feel better, I really was missing journalism. I liked teaching. I, I loved my students, but um, I liked journalism more. It was very exciting. I, I loved being a journalist. And um, and I, I, uh, I left that, and I just became a freelancer with more flexibility and I I, I wrote a, a, a column reviewing mystery books for the San Jose Mercury book section. I had a contract with the Washington Post magazine as a contributing writer uh, to do at least a certain number of articles a year for them. And in 1997, I guess, or eight, 1998, um, I applied for a Knight Fellowship, which is a mid-career journalism fellowship at Stanford. And um, I really applied with the idea that I'd study poetry there, but I didn't tell them that. Um, and, um, and I got it and it was a fantastic year. I divided my year between studying poetry and, um, and uh, bioethics, which is something I'd written some 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 things about uh, while well, while well, being a science writer at the Mercury News and and a magazine writer there, and um, and after that year, um, I just knew <laughs> that was the direction I wanted to go. So when I finished that year, um, I co-wrote a book, a journalistic book, with a friend of mine who lives in Berkeley, Christine Cosgrove, uh, called "Normal at Any Cost" about giving. Um, tall girls <laughs> estrogens to keep them shorter and, and, and short kids, mostly boys, growth hormone to make them taller. It was a kind of a 
a um, uh, case study in a way of what's going to happen as we think we can manipulate genetic uh, traits. And, uh, and it was supported with a, a, a grant from the Fund for Investigative Journalism, and, um, and it won a, a Science and Society Award from the National Association of Science Writers. And it was successful in every way except commercially and, um, <laughs> and didn't go into paperback. But um, at the same time, I started sending out poems, and I mm -hmm. uh, had a couple of chapbooks published, and, uh, and I started to have work in journals. And, uh, and, and um, my parents at that point, they'd had a wonderful old age up here. They came up and they started a, a group for, um, called Alternative, with other people, Alternative Lifelong Learning, a lot of retired yeah. professors and teachers and doctors and just, you know, people who wanted to keep learning and they, they led classes and so on, but they were both struggling at that point. Um, and, First my father died and then my mother. And um, to my astonishment, they hadn't, um, although my mother was almost 99, two weeks short of her 99th birthday, they'd left a little bit of money. And, um, and I decided I was gonna spend that on poetry. And I, uh, I uh, enrolled, I was accepted. I only applied one place, Pacific University, which is up in Oregon, Forestville, Oregon a low residency poetry program, uh, which means you go on campus twice a year for 10 days of workshops and lectures. And the rest of the time, it was like my high school correspondence course, the rest of the time you send in your work and, and they reply. And um, I had wonderful, fantastic teachers there and great friends and it was one of the highlights of my life. Between the time I applied and got accepted, my first full length book was accepted for publication and it came out. And then after I graduated in 2013, I took what the poems I'd done for my thesis and expanded a little and that got accepted and uh, won a prize and uh, from a small press in Minnesota and that came out in 2016. So um, yeah. <laughs> oh, you, your uh, poetry, you uh, provided me with links to uh, poems that uh, have a Yiddish Jewish connection. Yeah. Uh, were you writing poetry with that connection from the very beginning or did that come later? I always had at least one or two poems in every collection that had to do with being Jewish because it's important to me. It's part of who I am, even though I'm not religious. And um, but my most recent collection, which is actually coming out in um, later this year, uh, has poems specifically about learning Yiddish. And and um, it's interesting uh, when I you know I I started reading uh, you know being invited. To, to give readings in various places around the Bay Area, including um, readings out of an anthology, the Bloomsbury Anthology of Contemporary Jewish American Poetry that I was in, uh, and then a, a reading, uh, sometimes readings around Jewish topics. And um, at one of those readings, I don't remember which, I read a poem about, um, that was from my very first chapbook about wishing I knew Yiddish. It was addressed to Yiddish as a dying language. And afterwards, one of my fellow readers, uh, a younger woman named um, Colleen McKee, came up to me and said, you know, Yiddish isn't dead. It's not dying. I'm studying it. And that was the first I kind of, um, that I heard that there, that there were, in fact, um, people studying it. And, and um, so that was kind of in the back of my mind. But at that point, uh, you know, I had a lot of other things going on, so. So, um, the, um, you know, one of the uh, uh, poems, maybe this will come out a little bit, maybe I should ask this a little bit later, but uh, uh, one of the poems was just a, every line was a Yiddish, uh, phrase or something, and uh, 
uh, where did you do the research for that? I mean, how... oh, there's a lot online. You can find there's... whole you can find whole uh, websites devoted to Yiddish Yiddish wisdom. I think one's called. Oh. Uh, yeah, you can find it online. Um, yeah, that that type of poem is called a cento. It's a poem uh, that's made entirely of other people's lines, but oh. the poet puts together in in your own order and in your own way and you choose the lines and it's usually done poets write it with lines from other poets and it just occurred to me <laughs> that i could that i could do it with some Yiddish. Growing up, the, the, the only, the other memory of Yiddish I have besides the few words that my parents sprinkled in their conversation was that when my grandmother Ada visited once, um, she and my mother got into some animated conversation and they switched to Yiddish and I asked what they were saying. And my mother said, oh, it's just, um, it's just sayings. And, and, uh, and I said, well, what do they mean? And one of them was, they were obviously not just sayings, they were curses. And one of them was, uh, may, may he grow like an onion with his head in the ground. <laughs> so um, they're wonderful Yiddish sayings. <laughs> When you met the, the uh, woman who uh, was learning, uh, what did you then? How did you respond to that? Not in terms of uh, trying to find a place where you can learn. Well, I didn't immediately, other than to stop reading that poem because she <laughs> told me I was incorrect. Uh, but I, um, uh, so about three, a little more than three years ago, um, uh, I was just. I live very near the Berkeley Richmond JCC, and um, and uh, I had taken a class there through through a group called Warehouse Judaica. Um, I think they may have revived recently, but anyway, at that point they were sponsoring classes, and I'd taken one in in Judaism and art, and um, and so I was looking through their. They sent me their regular catalog, and I saw beginning Yiddish, and I thought. You know, all my life I've wanted to learn another language, and I never have, <laughs> mainly because my mother was so set on my learning Latin after all her Latin, uh, all her Latin education. She insisted I'd be able to learn every other language in the world if I only spent six years learning Latin. So I spent six years on Latin. Um, so um, I thought, you know, I will really want to know another language. Why not the one my grandparents spoke? So I just took it on a whim. And it was taught by a man named Ken Lady, who had grown up, uh, Ken lives in Berkeley, and he'd grown up in a Hasidic family and Yiddish was actually his first language. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a conversation class. And I learned a lot um, and I took it several times and we never sort of got beyond where does your family come from and where do you live? And, um, and I realized I was not that interested in conversation. Um, I didn't imagine I'd find anybody to talk to in Yiddish. Um, nobody in my family spoke it. And um, I, but it, I started looking online and discovered that there was a whole world of Yiddish literature 
and poetry, and poetry written by women especially, that I had grown up knowing absolutely nothing about. I mean, everybody's heard of Shola Malechem, if you've seen Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> um, you know, it's based on his short stories. But other than that, I had no idea. And it began to dawn on me that the Holocaust was not just about killing Jews. It was about stamping out a whole culture based on a language of European Jews that went back to the 10th or 11th century. Um, so I wanted to be, uh, begin learning more about the literature. And um, I remembered my poet friend, Colleen, and, and I called her and said, I'm learning some Yiddish. And we began to get together occasionally uh, for her to, to talk, she, most, she mostly, because she knew a lot more than I did. Um, and I began to buy books of poetry, for the most part, that had Yiddish on one side and English on the other. And I had to teach myself the, the letters. Uh, and Colleen told me that there were two other um, things going on at the JCC. On Monday nights, there was a reading group led by a professor from UC Berkeley, uh, Yael Haver, I think is her name. She, I may have the last name slightly wrong. Uh, she taught, uh, she recently retired, but she was teaching Yiddish at the university. And, um, but they read from the original texts and my reading was nowhere near as good. But Colleen also told me that there was a Monday morning group <laughs> and they read stories in, that were translated, transliterated into our alphabet. So with um, some trepidation, um, I started going to that. And I think Colleen came sometimes, but when her schedule allowed, but, um, but mostly it was a whole room full of people, uh, all of whom knew a lot more Yiddish than I was. And I pretty quickly figured out which person to sit next to. <laughs> and that was Norma. Uh, Solars and um, you know we'd be reading these stories and I'd be whispering to her what does that mean does that mean what does that sentence mean you know and um, and it was such a, a generous group of people and from there were Holocaust survivors there Ben Stern who survived from who was Ben must be a hundred now he was in his late 90s already and he survived uh, something like eight camps or nine camps and two forced marches. Um, and uh, there were a couple of other people from that generation. There were a lot of children of Holocaust survivors. There were people uh, um, like Dolores and Judy who had studied Yiddish uh, through various places. And, um, and it, but everybody, I think, except for me had heard Yiddish at home at some point in their life. And I, other than the punchline of a few jokes, my parents didn't want me to understand. I really hadn't. Um, so they were very generous. And um, at one point, um, a group of uh, five or six of us started sometimes going from there to lunch and trying to speak in Yiddish. And um, I can't remember how long I'd been going to that when, uh, when uh, Norma um, let it be known to me that she was interested in learning how to read. She was fluent speaking. She spoke it, it was her first language, uh, but uh, uh, she had never learned how to read it. And um, I was learning how to read it. And, uh, and then, you know, we, we sort of asked amongst our, our smaller group whether anybody was interested in meeting another day, a week, and um, reading things together and trying to read them in the original. Um, and that's how our group assembled. And Colleen started with us, um, but then it was uh, didn't fit in with her schedule. But um, the rest of us just continued. And then we migrated. To, we used to go to different houses, but mostly Dolores's. And then we, we migrated to Zoom when the pandemic hit. So what happened to that original group that 
uh, as far as I know, it didn't meet. I mean, uh, yeah. because of the pandemic, and of course, a lot of the members were really elderly, mm -hmm. <laughs> more elderly even than I am, and um, and uh, so vulnerable. So when the JCC shut down, um, I would get an occasional email from one or the other people, persons saying that they missed the group. But it, yeah, yeah. Mm. So it, it didn't. Um, I hope it resumes again, but uh, mm. no word on that so far. Well, how does the group get its name? Okay. I think maybe Dolores came up with it. <laughs> but of course, Mama Lotion is is a fond name for Yiddish. It means mother mother tongue. And um, you know, I've learned a lot more about Yiddish. And one is that um, even though there were writers, male writers who wrote in it, it was often dismissed as a, a, a female language. The men, the men were sent off to Heder to school to learn at three or four to learn Hebrew and um, study the texts. And the, the women were the ones who spoke Yiddish in the home. And um, so it was kind of derived, you know, it was derided a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, a little. <laughs> and um, uh, so, but Mama Lotion is both fond and, and, and kind of refers to the fact that it was dismissed as a, as a, as a something that the women spoke and wrote in because they didn't know Hebrew. How does the uh, group uh, select its, uh, the subjects or books that it reads? You know, we just try and find things um, for the most part that have um, English translations, preferably mm -hmm. ones on the opposite pages. And, and there's not enough of that, but uh, you know, there are some sites online that we can print things out of. And then there's some books, um, mm -hmm. there are a few books and um, yeah, we just sort of discuss what we'd like to read next. And uh, so what are you reading now? We're reading from a collection that just came out called uh, Golden Apave, which means golden peacock. And it's uh, mostly poetry, but it's um, different authors. Uh, it was put out by Sheva Zucker, who's, uh, I don't know her affiliation, but she's with one of the national, she's a Yiddishist, mm -hmm. try and say that fast. And, um, uh, uh, and she's gathered together samples, really, and with a recording. Um, mm -hmm. So we're working our way through that. Uh, right before that, we finished um, Sholem Aleichem's, uh, the second volume of his stories about Matol, the, the cantor's son. The first volume takes place in the old country, and the, and the volume we just finished takes place in America. So it's early immigrant impressions of New York City, really. So how, how do you uh, conduct the class? You know, we schmooze. <laughs> we, we, uh, before the pandemic, we would, we would meet at various, mostly at Dolores's, but occasionally at my house, occasionally at Sharon's house, occasionally at Judy's house. Um, and, um, and we chat in Yiddish as much as possible, and and we'd read and um, and on Zoom we do the same thing. Usually, people ask how everybody's doing and if there's anything new in anybody's life, and then and then at some point says somebody will say, "Well, should we read?" <laughs> Is your reading and speaking improving? Yes, uh, definitely. Um, unexpected and one of the only benefits of this pandemic is when I started out just three or so years ago, it was hard to find things online in Yiddish, about Yiddish, lessons in Yiddish, uh, recordings in Yiddish, and it has just exploded online. And um, I could have a Yiddish conversation any day of the week with people from all over the world. 
Um, and uh, and um, the first online class I took was actually pre-pandemic. It was through the um, Workman's Circle, Arbiter's Ring uh, in New York. I took one, I, I, <laughs> I signed up for an intermediate class, even though I really was not intermediate, but I could read at that point. So, um, and uh, when, after the pandemic hit, the, the young man who was teaching it contacted me and asked me and told me he moved out of New York City and was living in California with his mother. And um, he wanted to teach privately online. And did I know anybody else who might be interested? And I asked our, our group, the Mama Lotions, and a few people were. So some of us signed up together mm -hmm. and, um, and not all of us continued, but, uh, but uh, uh, Sharon and Norma and I have continued. And, uh, and we've taken a succession of classes, uh, grammar, learning grammar, which is not really fun, but you know, it's, it helps your Yiddish. <laughs> and, um, and besides that, I take a second class with uh, Reb Noyach, Noah Barrera, and, uh, and that's a reading class. And um, that's just two other people and myself, and we've read various things. So I don't know, you know, it's a combination of all that that's improved my, my, my Yiddish. But, you know, um, having a group, I call them my Yiddish crew, <laughs> um, you know, to really, really hang together through the pandemic and, and to be familiar and comfortable with and, and, you know, to laugh at our mistakes and each other's mistakes and not to feel like you're performing for a, for a class is, is a wonderful yeah. thing. Yeah. Do you expect to uh, meet in person when things loosen up, or are you good, yeah. going to continue? No, I think. Well, Norma's moved at, uh, to Grass Valley, but other yeah. than that, I, I think we will try and do some combination of meeting in person and yeah. and on Zoom. Um, yeah, it's fun. I mean, above all, it's fun. <laughs> um, you know, but also I've just I've learned so much about um, Jewish life. Uh, about really what the Holocaust was all about. And, and as a writer, um, I feel a responsibility to read this writing, which was wonderful, um, because their readers were wiped out. And the Yiddish-speaking communities that exist are the, the Hasidic communities. They don't, they're very, they're insular. They're their own world. They don't read the literature. Um, and, um, and besides them, they're just, you know, where are the readers? So, mm -hmm. um, so I feel a responsibility to read these writers. Um, and I've even with, um, yeah, I'm sure you know the Yiddish word chutzpah with a little chutzpah, I've begun mm -hmm. translating some poetry and, uh, and I feel it's important to, to also introduce them to the wider non-Yiddish speaking world. Yeah. Is your group, um, uh, does it publicize? Do you want to expand or do you feel pretty uh, the, the, the larger group we came out of yeah. met at the GC, JCC was always open and looking for new members. And we uh, several people in there belong to the Yiddish uh, chorus, which is a San Francisco uh, group, and um, and I guess they they put an advertise. We all chipped in for an advertisement once a year um, uh, through the chorus, some publication to advertise the group, and um, yeah, so that was interested in expanding. Um, mm -hmm. You know, our group that evolved out of that is, is, is basically at this point is based on friendship. I don't think we would turn anybody down who, who um, uh, uh, especially somebody who lives locally, but uh, uh, yeah. This is kind of a general thing, uh, or maybe it's a specific thing. Uh, in the Bay Area, are there uh, other Yiddish resources, classes? I mean, the, the uh, 
Yiddish chorus? Do they give public concerts? And yeah, yeah and you should ask um, Judy and um, Millie yeah. are very active. Okay. Millie may even be head of it now. Um, yes, uh, uh, there's a lot. I mean, the Workman Circle actually uh, pre-pandemic, and I assume online now was offering a free class at the Berkeley at the San Francisco Public Library for beginners and um, and maybe intermediate and um, Klez California, which is uh, supports klezmer music, sponsors. They actually, I think, sponsored some of the classes at the JCC. Um, and and uh, there's a group of of people who are fluent, who meet and converse and um, around a specific theme. Oh, uh, I don't know whether it's once a month or not. I I haven't mm -hmm. got to that. There's um, the university, of course, uh, teaches Yiddish, um, but being university courses, you have to commit to, you know, five day a week kind of intensive. And, um, and then there's a group that grew out of, um, and again, um, some of the people in our group have been active because they've all been much more active for many more years in, with Yiddish, the Yiddish clubs. And there was a Yiddish club uh, on the peninsula run by a man named Fischl, and I don't know his last name, which has gone online. And uh, every Tuesday morning, they have a speaker who comes uh, and speaks in Yiddish. And afterwards, they break into small groups and, and people can converse in the small groups. And the, I, I don't go on every week, but the last time I was on, week before last, I think there were 60 people who came to hear the speaker. And some of the people, there was a woman who actually lives now in Lithuania. There were people who live in South Africa. There were people who live in various countries in Europe. There are a lot of people who live in Canada. Montreal uh, was a huge uh, Yiddish speaking center. Montreal, Toronto, Winnipeg. Um, people who live in Florida, New York, and New Jersey, of course, and California. Um, uh, but just, uh, and people who had spoken Yiddish as children and have not had the opportunity since then. It's very meaningful for, for some people who, who, um, who thought that they would never have anybody to speak it with again. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's a wonderful connection, and I don't think that would have ever happened without the the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Well, I um, have no more questions. Uh, I want to thank you. Uh, let's does that, see. Does does that mean I talked too much? <laughs> well,